I want to thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I must begin by commending Chairman Walton, Chairman Upton, Ranking Member Pallone, my friend and colleague from the great state of Colorado, uh, Congresswoman Dijgat, the committee staff, and all for working with my office to bring this, the 21st century workforce legislation to the House floor today. I must also publicly acknowledge the leadership of my colleague, Mr. A. Hudson of North Carolina, and his staff, who played an instrumental and very important role in helping us to get to this point. Mr. Speaker, this 21st century workforce bill represents hope, represents opportunity for many of our fellow citizens who feel as though they have been locked out of the American dream. Mr. Speaker, this workforce bill also provides an example of how Congress should function and work on behalf of the American people. This legislation enjoys the overwhelming support of members of Congress who represent various constituencies from diverse regions of our nation and who come with different and varying political persuasion. However, Mr. Speaker, we were able to put aside our political differences, our regional differences, our cultural differences, and focus our efforts on bringing forth a job bill that will benefit all communities and help lift up the American economy for all its people. Mr. Speaker, this bill directs the Secretary of Energy to prioritize the training of unrepresented groups, including minorities, women, and veterans, as well as this, this place and unemployed energy and manufacturing workers. This bill directs the Secretary of Energy to take into full recognition the hurt and the pain of the white middle class, I mean, white working class, the African American, the black working class, the brown working class, in order to increase the number of skilled candidates trained to work in the related fields that's brought to bear by the energy, this renaissance in our nation. This bill will strengthen and more fully engage Department of Energy programs and national laboratories in order to carry out the department's workforce development initiatives. This legislation will help to develop a skilled labor force trained to work in a wide array of sectors, including renewables, energy efficiency, oil and gas, coal, nuclear, utility, pipeline, alternative fuels, as well as energy intensive and advanced manufacturing industry. Mr. Speaker, as we know, the energy and manufacturing industries are two of the most critical and fastest growing sectors, both domestically as well as internationally. The potential of these two industries can help bolster the American economy and are also vital to the growing number of people seeking middle class status, seeking not just a change of lifestyle, but seeking more money. They are satisfied with their lifestyle. They just need more income. It's important, Mr. Speaker, that we equip our citizens with the skills needed 
to meet this growing demand so that we can tap into these tremendous opportunities. And this bill, Mr. Speaker, will help accomplish that goal. Mr. Speaker, this 21st century workforce legislation addresses an issue that is neither partisan nor bipartisan, but rather it is nonpartisan. It's a nonpartisan issue that benefits communities, benefits industry, and benefits the overall American economy. This bill brings together government agencies, including the national labs, the energy and manufacturing industry, unions, schools, community colleges, and universities, among others, and promotes cooperation and collaboration to ensure that we are tapping into a wealth of underutilized talent and training and preparing workers for the energy and manufacturing jobs of the present and also of the future. Mr. Speaker, one of the challenges that many of my constituents and constituents all across the land have brought to my attention pertaining to individuals participating in training programs that in many cases don't even lead to finding a job. With that in mind, Mr. Speaker, this bill will help industry, schools, and community-based workforce organizations to identify candidates for enrollment in to training and apprenticeship programs. The objective will be to ensure that the skills learned are immediately transferable to good-paying jobs, good-paying careers within the energy and manufacturing sectors, regionally, nationally, and indeed internationally. Mr. Speaker, this bill is important because it matches up the needs of industry with a willing and able workforce, and in the process helps start new cycles of hope and opportunity for groups who have, in many cases, been overlooked and underserved. The white, middle class, uh, white working class and the black working class and the brown working class. This legislation can help to open new pathways to jobs, careers, and entrepreneurial opportunities for women, minorities, our veterans, and all the different working classes that comprise the American workforce, while also helping to move our overall economy forward. Mr. Speaker, at a time when African American and Latino unemployment rates are too high, when coal miners throughout the Rust Belt and beyond are finding themselves without work, when too many female heads of households cannot find adequate employment to take care of their families, when veterans returning from defending their, our country still cannot find a job. It is a travesty, Mr. Speaker, a travesty that eager employers still cannot locate the trained workers that they so desperately need. This is common sense, Mr. Speaker, and this is a common sense jobs bill that will help match up trained, qualified candidates with good paying jobs and careers that will, help with, that will help lift up communities, strengthen the energy and manufacturing industry, and bolster the entire American economy as a whole. With this focus not, on, not only on underserved communities, such as minorities, women, and veterans, 
but also displaced and unemployed, unemployed coal miners and other out of energy, out of work energy workers. I can assure you, Mr. Speaker, that when this legislation ultimately becomes law, it will go a long way in helping not only communities look like the one I represent on the south side of, of Chicago, but it look like communities all across the nation, including the communities in West Virginia, in Kentucky, in Indiana, and in New Mexico, all across this country, every community and every district throughout this nation. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank you, and I yield. I, and I yield. I reserve you. Mr. Speaker, I just want to say, as I've watched these uh, two gentlemen, Mr. Rush and Mr. Hudson, work together, something that our committee does a lot on lots of different issues, from oversight to energy to health care to telecommunications. And Mr. Rush, you've had an outstanding career. Uh, your district is close to mine. You and I have been in each other's districts uh, quite a bit over, over, the, over the last number of years. This bill is a legacy to you. Uh, you have cared with real passion about energy jobs and making sure that we have the expertise, the technical training, knowing that we want to compete with the rest of the world. And I commend you again for working with Mr. Hudson, a, a brilliant star on, on our side of the aisle, uh, to get this bill done. We look forward to the president signing it in, into law, working for, looking forward to having the Senate move similar bipartisan legislation so we can get, get the job done. That's what it's all about. So I want to thank you uh, for your tireless commitment to get this issue done. And uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, with that, I yield back the balance of my time and urge my colleagues to support this bill again. Thank you. Question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bill H.R. 338? Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being of the affirmative, the rules are suspended. The bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table.